good. I liked it better the other time when you went and you took the big sweep until the sea and then start your diminuendo, which doesn't mean piano yet, because the real piano is on the next F sharp. So I don't think she's the sort of person that courts publicity as such. It's really by word of mouth, in the trade, so to speak, that one hears of her. But her reputation is spreading year by year, and quite rightly so. I think she's one of the finest artists in the world. My teacher declared I would be his assistant, and I was very embarrassed because they were all much older boys and girls, and I was a bit intimidated, but they liked it. And I liked to teach. Apparently, I had a certain gift for that. I always had it. I liked to improve things and to help people to do things better. Each of the ballads is inspired on a Polish poem. And the story of this ballad is, well, it's the most tragic. If there is a, imagine a, a huge hall and a banquet and people are, are sitting, eating, and each gets up and tells his own stories. And at a certain moment, a tall man, huge man, clad in black, he gets up and he says, and now, I'm going to tell you my story, which is a story of death, of love, of destruction, of misery. And he tells this story, and then at the end says, and I've brought you all this. You are all going to die. And that's why you can imagine the panic of the coda. Maria Curcio's career has brought her into contact with some of the greatest names in 20th century music. Nadia Boulanger, Fritz Busch, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf and Benjamin Britten, amongst many others. During the years after the war, when illness left Maria unable to pursue her own career as a pianist, younger musicians increasingly sought her out for her remarkable abilities as a teacher. The main thing which struck me was her instinct for music and the way she immediately went to the heart of the music. And so it was the temperament, the great emotion, which, uh, which struck me as a, as, a, as a shock, really. You have to play the feeling of the composer. And there is a direct line between the soul of the composer and your soul. As there is a direct line, and this is, I think, what I learned most from Britain. The immediate contact of the ear with the finger because the brain commands the ear, the ear commands the finger, and the line must be straight. Yes. I teach a lot the Chopin. I find all the ballads useful, but the first ballad is pianistically, musically of course, but pianistically one of the most difficult pieces Chopin has written. Mozart and Chopin were both two enormous, great, greatest genius, but they were also fabulous pianists. So they wrote for the instrument in a perfect way. And if you can play Mozart and you can play Chopin, then you are a real, a real musician and a real pianist. beautiful thing is to hold this bound note, this syncopation, to the bass note. Try, you will see how beautiful it is. for the waltz later. But 
But here, this is absolutely sighing and crying. And here is always the fear, the dread of what is following. Always you must have this present in you. Do it once more. It's beautiful like this. Do di do di do do. In the ballads, I mean, there is always this, these stories, and you have to refer somehow to it, but never let the literature interfere with the music. It mustn't be the center. The center remains the music. But let us enjoy more this letter. Mi re re so, re re mi re re so, re mi re re so, re re. This is fantastic, and it's very good here to wait. Unfortunately, one has made of Chopin a miniature composer, a man who composed salon music for the pretty ladies. But it's not at all that, because Chopin always talks about. He's an exiled man, and he suffers. He talks of the loneliness, of the exile, of the nostalgia for his country, of great love, of great, great feelings. And every ballad is inspired on great, great, great different feeling. And I can't stand the idea that many people underplay Chopin, underplay him as a composer, as a man. Here, these are the famous big themes of Chopin, where he composes it in the sound for the two hands. And the left hand is very important. And also the rhythm. Si, do, do, la, la, da, 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 da. This is the phrasing, you see. You have to do more. Do once the left hand. the left hand. so many different forms of music and so many different pieces. If you start with the shorter works and you know all the forms, then you can go much easier to the big works. You can't start with the fourth ballad, which is musically one of the most difficult pe pieces of our repertoire. It's impossible to start with the fourth. And generally, if they play a ballad, they play the fourth ballad. And they play the B minor sonata, which is unreachable like that. Do you ever say to a young one, you're doing too much too fast? Yes. Sometimes you have to, st and especially if their repertoire is not big enough, it's very, very dangerous. Because if they enter the big career, then there is little time to develop. You have to have a background, a background as a musician and as a pianist. In this, I believe. Maria Coccio's own background as a pianist was nurtured by a distinguished line of teachers, initially in Italy. By the time she was 14, she was already studying with Nadia Boulanger in Paris. However, it was in the following year that she began to work with the musician who was to have the greatest influence on her, the legendary pianist and teacher, Arthur Schnabel. When Schnabel died, all the young Schnabel pupils came. I was very honored to receive them, because they thought that I remembered him better than they did. I don't think I did remember him better, but I kept him always very fresh and very alive in me. Schnabel was always, for us, so positive and so encouraging, and most of my teaching I've learned from him. And if I never have experienced, and I've experienced many lessons, a lesson where he wasn't 100% there for the pupil and inspiring, never. 
he never repeated himself. And he hated anybody would say to him, but last year in the lesson on, in this spot, you said this. He said, why am I not allowed to improve and to change? Because he was always recreating music. He was never performing it because he was also a composer. He was always approaching music as a composer, recreating it. This is always a little bit unrestful. Yes, you must go up. You see this Music is three-dimensional, so when we pass from the horizontal to the vertical, something happens. And with you, it's a little bit too horizontal. You must really go up the chromatic. Yes, and that to the last note, really. This is very important. The double bar, the change, the modulation, the change of tonality. This E flat must have a completely different color. And he, and he writes crescendo and ritenente. In one bar, you must do a lot. No, no, I don't believe this has to be. More. more. This has to be more. A clear sound. But he doesn't write the minuendo. So do, you have got many things to do in these few bars. Do, do it again. Grow. Yes, but you don't feel it. No, no and you have to, I'm sorry, you have to do it. She can explore the possibilities in phrases uh, which you would never really have thought of or you would not really be quite sure about how to realize them. And so she really does put a big emphasis on sound and on pedaling. Um, and a lot of the time speaks, even in a, a Mozart piece or Beethoven piece, the, about the impressionistic um, view where, you know, the colors on the canvas are so important. And it's just, it's not just Ravel and Debussy, which are traditionally thought of as the impressionist composers she um, actually applies this to all music, which is very important. Yes, this you play too brilliant, you must go much more melodically and much more harmonically, and these are the syncopations. You must sing like string instruments, not play staccato, la, fa, la, do, mi. Play once for me this slowly. Yes, and in the fast tempo you must have this quality. Beethoven sonatas are all difficult. It's exactly like the symphonies. It's immensely difficult for any conductor to, to conduct beautifully a Beethoven symphony. That's why we hear them very often, but very seldom marvelously performed. Because Beethoven went so far 
emotionally, you know, in his music, that to render the real quintessence of his feeling and his thought is something that very few people can reach. Because you have to transform the sound in feeling immediately. And you see, he didn't write pianistically. He, he thought orchestrally. last sonatas are really impregnated of this incredible transcendental quality and this deep religion and this closeness to God. And I think in, the, in, in this sonata you can feel God close to him really all the time. all teachers she has her party pieces which she uh, likes to have all her students learn um, I managed to escape them actually <laughs> maybe because I was quite scared that you know this would show me up eventually as a fraud <laughs> so, so uh, there's a Schumann and Mozart that figure quite prominently but she realizes as we all should realize that um, all music is one really all composers are one and they they're so interrelated that you can't ignore ones I mean you can't say I'm a Mozart specialist and never play Chopin or Schoenberg or something they all tie in and you should this is very why well, it's very important to have a broad repertoire maybe not to perform it but uh, to appreciate all music and try and understand something and how it applies to you and she really appreciates this interrelation of composers and, and musical history during the, some years after uh, the war, uh, the late Joseph Tripps worked a great deal as a conductor of the Netherlands Opera. And Maria attended many of his rehearsals. And Tripps was a wonderful rehearser. He was a marvelous conductor, but I mean, his rehearsals were quite outstanding. He knew more about singing uh, than I think many conductors. And Maria absorbed that with full uh, participation. Being Italian, I've, I've always, of course, had a passion for the, for the voice. But being in contact with great conductors who were also great coaches like Fritz Busch and, and Joseph Cripps and others, I got interested in coaching singers. And that I could do with a pianist playing, and I just was good. And the singers thought that I was able to help them. And this has helped me very much as a pianist and as a, as a teacher. And Schnabel always said, sing a phrase. If you can't sing it properly, you can't play. Sing. This is very important. And here the same thing. They are catching each other. Then they do this, you see? And your fingers must give us these feelings, you see? And generally, one hears it in concert, by far too static, eh? by far too 
too timid, too dull. And then the piece, even great artists, they don't catch the spirit. And I was lucky enough to, to study it with Arthur Schnabel, who really made an unforgettable creation of this. Because you saw this, this personage, you saw Colombina, you saw Pantalon, you saw Arlecchino, and they were dancing, and they were embracing each other, and they were running, and they were catching. And you must, with your ten fingers, you must give us that. Yes. Uh, yes, but you, because you are poetical with the left hand, you are not gay enough with the right hand. You must be an artist. You must be able to play with one hand one mood and with the other hand the other mood. Do alone the right hand. what it is, you see? But you always give the accent on the D. You must give the D. Yes. And this time, you see, the A is justified yes. because he writes an accent, the dominant. He wants. Ta -ra, la, la. Yes. We must hear the sounds we want to produce because we have got rhythm and sound. These are the two means we have to express our thoughts, but uh, our feeling, our thoughts about what we want to do, this is the main thing. But this has to be planned beforehand. What has not got to be planned beforehand is communication and projection, because that has to be intuitive. <laughs> Modulation. Yes. You see, you, know, you have to come in this A flat from the F minor. You have to really open your heart and come into it. And this is, there's always in Schumann's, almost always, an homage a Chopin. And this is for me homage a Chopin. Yes. This is so Chopinesque. Mm -hmm. Think of Chopin when you play this. Think of the Embrontius. Because look, this fantastic left hand. And they are hugging each other. They are going to each other all the time, you see. It's richer than you do it. In, in the carnival are there already. It's opus two, and everything is in it. All the little pains, and the little laughter, and the little jokes, and their fun, uh, everything is there. And it's so human, it is so extraordinary. How could he really see music as he saw it? It's, it's quite extraordinary. Upbeat. thinking about music even if one's having dinner together you can always see that music is running through her head not only through her head because she quite often drums on the table 
um, and is playing th various phrases from a Beethoven sonata. Um, I think she's always trying to find new ways of looking at a piece of music. And um, from year to year, she's always um, finding new things in music. She's never satisfied with um, where she is at the moment. She's always discovering something new in music, and it, it's her whole life. Yes. And if you want, you can give in here a little yes. bit. And here there is an exit. forget in the previous one and very often there is a little tear always there is the moment of year in the ritenuto there is the moment of sadness because they know that the feast is going to be over and that they have to part but then they can't resist the dance and they they are happy again and they say oh we are still together but everywhere in Papillon there is a little tear also here. Yes, no, doesn't matter. Now we are dancing. The amazing thing about her is that she always gives uh, to her pupils unconditionally, in a sense, uh, where she's very, very concerned in the absolutely in the right way about their musical development and indeed their personal development. She follows uh, a pupil's or a student's progress through many, many different pieces and even after they've maybe stopped going to her, she again continues that interest. So there's an amazing dedication to her work. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds okay. Try yeah. something with the bass. With the bass, okay. Well, cadenza, maybe. Mm. Through so many more pianists, we don't have more great pianists than we used to have. The, the elite remains small. And unfortunately, there are too many which are just good, but good is not enough. And that's why there are so many competitions, and all these pianists try the competitions, and the competitions have become very political. But what do we do without competitions? I mean, there are so few openings, because now the, the, the real figure of the impresario has disappeared because the impresario was somebody who went to a concert or to a, to a ho home and listened to a gifted artist and said, well, I'm going to take you and going to make your career. Now, this, there is no time for all that. Now the managers take the ready-made career, people who have already concerts, who, who, have, who have won a competition, an important competition, and there is very little opening for those who are, not, who are not lucky enough to have a protection, to have concerts, to have played for a conductor who helps them. And it's very, very, very difficult. And this is the most difficult part of my work, my worry for the future of many of my pupils. last, that's why the left hand, as you do, is very, very important here, because it's a reminder of the second theme, and this is the last cry of despair. And then, because you can play pianistically as well as you do, try to give us really this panic and this madness and this rush of the people, you know, escaping. Not 
don't just don't worry about the notes, but worry about the feeling behind, and let's see what comes. Does she still help you? I mean, do you still ask her advice? Yes, um, we talk from time to time, and uh, she comes to uh, as many concerts as she possibly can of mine. And um, if ever I, uh, I'd like some advice about a piece, I may go along and play it to her. And it's just always very interesting, of course, what she has to say. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it.